How many of you have ever been asked the question, how's your prayer life? I hope, I mean, have you ever been asked that question, how's your prayer life? I don't know, when you hear that question, at least when I hear that question, it, uh, the first thing that you do is you then start to consider, well, how do exactly do I evaluate my prayer life? And so we are entering into a series about prayer, and I know that we've learned a lot of things about prayer, a lot of things from the Bible that we've read on our own, a lot of things that we've been taught by the people that we respect and who have taught us about prayer, and um, kind of the heart of this series for me is, you know, have you ever heard the phrase, um, like the more that you learn, the more you understand, the more you realize that there's so much that you don't understand? Okay, something along those lines. Well, I will tell you as a, just me and my journey as a witness, I've learned quite a lot about prayer that I didn't know about. And uh, I think we need to be open, and I hope there's an openness in mind of what, what prayer is. What does that look like in the life of someone who is following Jesus intentionally, intentionally in their life? Um, I learned a lesson when I was young. There was a, a mentor figure who gave us the lesson as young men. He said that anytime someone is looking for someone to lead you in prayer, don't let that be on hold for very long. Because you need to understand the amazing opportunity is to go and to speak to the God, the creator of this world. And so there's been lessons that I've, I've learned, and I'm not sharing this series by someone who has mastered and understands prayer. That's not what's happening here. But I am excited to share some things about prayer. But before that, I would like you to look at the black frogfish. Okay, the black frogfish is, there's all, I've learned that there are all types of frogfish. This one looks very menacing, and he's down in the dark depths, and he's got these glowing blue eyes, and they, um, the thing about frogfish is they have very good camouflage. From one type of frogfish to another, they, they can camouflage themselves so well. But the other thing that they share in common is, and you probably could notice this from this picture, but they all have a fishing rod and a lure attached to their forehead. Okay, you see that little tiny line right in the middle, and there's something that he uses a lure. And isn't that interesting? You know, if you believe that this world is an accident, that is some kind of accident that leaves these fish with a fishing rod and lure that they, they attract fish to, and then they attack them. And their attack is six milliseconds. They, they're good fishers with what they've been equipped with. And uh, I can, cannot help but see the eternal power, divine nature of a Creator God and the things that have been made. Amen? Father, we just want to come to You right now. And as it's already been said today, but can be said for the rest of our lives, how, um, how blessed we are because of what You've already done for us. And so, Lord, I just pray that as we discuss and we talk about the prayer life, that, Father, that you will convict us, that you will, that there will be something that we hear, something that we are challenged by in your word, Father, that, that, that just elicits this strong desire to be in fellowship with you. And we pray this in your son's name. Amen. So how many of you have ever been told this phrase, get a life? Have you ever been told that? Get a life. You know, I think that there's something that's in common with whenever you hear that phrase. I think it's normally associated with an overcommitment to something. So maybe you are a reality TV super fan, okay? And you know all the seasons, and you know all the characters, and you know all the puzzles, and someone may say, you need to get a life, right? They see that as an overcommitment. Or maybe it's an overcommitment, and you, you, you like video games. You sure do. And you spend a lot of your time, your money, your resources, and, and you may hear that phrase, get a life. Um, it could be in something like a hobby. Maybe you love Coke memorabilia, and you have sheds that are devoted to your Coke memorabilia. And someone may say, you need to get a life. What are they saying when they're saying get a life? I mean, you have a life, right? I like, I like my Coke memorabilia. I have a life. I I do, um, I'm, I'm living, I'm breathing. What's being said in that comment? What's being, what's that? 
Yeah, well, they're, they're, evaluating, they're evaluating not the fact that you don't actually live, that you're not actually breathing, but they're, they're challenging the quality of your life, right? When they say, get a life. So, deep question this morning, do you have a quality life? Um, I think people would determine, the, the, the way that they would answer what a quality life is, is kind of subjective. Some people would evaluate what a quality life is based on the riches that I'm surrounded by, and that's the type of quality life. Others would evaluate a quality life as based on the type of experiences that you're living. Others would say, no, it's about the relationships that you have in your life. Well, what I would like to propose today is that I have the solution, the answer to what quality life is. Are you intrigued? I hope so. Here's what I say quality life is. Quality life is a prayer life. And that's not a typo this morning. That's what I wanted to put on the screen. Quality life is a prayer life. Notice I didn't say quality life includes prayer. I didn't say that because what I'm, what I'm trying to say is that a quality life is a prayer life where your life is becoming a prayer. Um, when you hear the question, how is your prayer life? The thing that I don't like about that question is that it makes you think of prayer as this isolated, kind of separate part of your life. How's your social life? How's work life? How's this life? When you think of prayer as just a, a part of your life that you can tweak and master, that is not what I am professing. That is not what I am attempting to share over the next several weeks. Where prayer is something more than just a part of your life, but it is becoming all of your life. Here's some possibilities in prayer that if we have an open mind to what prayer, the prayer life is, um, you can do things like praying with your eyes open. You ever done that? Praying with your eyes open with a group of people. You ever done that? <laughs> praying without uh, saying amen. Praying without saying words. Now, what are we talking about? Praying while in a conversation with another person. These may be new things that you've never even considered. And I'm here to say this morning that there is a lot more about prayer that I want to learn and what I've experienced in my life. So this morning, we're going to kind of take the scenic route to the introduction of a prayer life, and we're going to be in 1 Thessalonians 5. So 1 Thessalonians 5, if you're saying this isn't about prayer, we're heading there. It says this in the first two verses. It says, Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you, for you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. All right, we are living in some times and seasons, aren't we? Everybody is always. And I've had this conversation recently with several people, how when you start to examine the times that we're living, and especially for me or even my children or my grandchildren, you start to wonder and you can become nervous about that, the times that we're living. Just some encouragement. Here's my encouragement. God foreknew you. He foreknew your children, your grandchildren, and there is a time and a destiny that we're meant for, and God has placed us there. So we can take comfort in that. But it's saying, about the times and the season, I don't need to write anything to you about that, but the day of the Lord, you're fully aware, the day of the Lord will, will come like a thief in the night. And that is somewhat of an unsettling analogy, isn't it? Like a thief in the night. So when I was a newlywed with Michelle, I also learned that a couple things. Number one, Michelle hears things at night. And number two, I learned it's my responsibility to investigate, investigate those sounds in the night, okay? And so that was a little bit of an adjustment when we first got married, and she would wake me up, hey, did you hear something? And uh, I, I didn't. I didn't, but I will go investigate something for you. And there was, I do remember one instance in particular that I actually did hear. I thought, oh, maybe, she, maybe she's on to something. And walking downstairs with a, I didn't have much, but I had a shoe. I had a shoe in my hand. I have better ways of, of home defense now, but 
It's kind of an unsettling thought that the day of the Lord will be like a thief in the night. It goes on in verse 3. While people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman and they will not escape. Okay, so a thief in the night, like labor pains, destruction will come. We sing songs like, come Jesus, come. This sounds nothing like a happy heart for Jesus to come. This is not for us. This is not for us. This is not the experience for those in Christ. If we continue reading in verse 4, it says this, But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. That's good news, isn't it? It says, For, all, for you all are children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness, so let us not sleep as others do. But let us keep awake and be sober. All right, so this is not for those in Christ, not to be surprised like a thief in the night. Why? Because we're children of the day, we're children of the light, and in light of that, don't go to sleep. Right? In light of that, don't go to sleep, just always be awake. Now that's an answer to not be surprised by a thief in the night, isn't it? Like if you were really concerned that about people that were coming to your house at night, I don't think that would really do much for a lot of people. Just don't go to sleep. Always to be awake. Now we know that this is not a literal prescription for us, that we would never sleep physically, but that we would always be enlightened. We would always understand and walk in faith of where we are with the Lord because of what He's done. Always being awake. But just notice, at the beginning of this chapter, there is this seemingly impossible task of always being awake. And I love finding connections in Scripture because later on in that same chapter, there's another seemingly impossible task. And in 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18, it says this Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. I believe this is how we stay awake. Part of this, um, a lot of people will want to rationalize the words that we read on the screen. But let me ask you this morning. Let me read this again. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Let me ask you a series of questions. When should we rejoice? Okay. When should we pray? Oh, I heard a without ceasing. What does that mean? <laughs> yes. Always. When should we give thanks? Okay. Now, I could, we could talk about rejoicing always. We could talk about giving thanks always. But what I want us to focus on is the fact that we read in Scripture, after one seemingly impossible task to always be awake, never go to sleep, we're also told to pray always. This is impossible if praying is a very specific thing you have in mind. If prayer to you is about a certain posture, it's about where your hands are, about how your if your your eyes are closed, that you're speaking words, that you're dedicating to a very specific time of prayer. Let me say that is impossible. There's only so long you can pray like that, right? I'm not crazy. We can't pray without ceasing in a prayer like that. So this series is about making your life a prayer life and how in the world can I do that? How can I pray without stopping? So, we're going to think a little bit outside the box in this series. Um, and I do want to say that that kind of praying, I'm not speaking against that kind of praying. Okay? That kind of praying, that specific kind of prayer, there are varieties of prayers. I said earlier, praying without saying a amen. Am I saying that we don't say in the name of Jesus, Amen. No, we need to pray in the name of Jesus. We need to pray in that authority and that confidence. 
But we are told to pray without ceasing. The prayer life. If I could make it just very simple, what this series is in one line, as a real good time to just listen to this. This is what this is. This is what this series is, the prayer life. It is your relationship with the indwelling Holy Spirit. I don't think I could put it any more simple than that. The prayer life is your relationship with the indwelling Holy Spirit. So, I want us to spend one to two minutes. I'm going to make you, some of you uncomfortable. And I'd like you to stand up and find someone near you and ask this question. How does pray without ceasing challenge you? Spend a minute or two with someone near you and ask this question. All right, I'm going to have you go ahead and find a seat. So I believe what the Bible says is absolutely attainable to those who seek. And I believe when the Word says that we can pray without ceasing, I absolutely think that it is possible. And uh, so, again, this is what we will be talking about the next several weeks. And before we can even begin to talk about prayer, I think at least what came to my mind was the, the most important thing is the, the approach to prayer. What is the motive that we have in having a relationship with the indwelling Holy Spirit in our life? What is the motive that we have when we speak with the Creator God who knew us before we were formed? What is the motive? So, I want to look in Matthew 6. We're going, to, we're going to talk two motives, two wrong motives today in approaching God in prayer. So in Matthew chapter 6, in verse 5, And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. Jesus says that the hypocrites love to pray. That phrase has really stood out to me. It's something to really kind of ponder. But there are people who Jesus says love to pray and not to be like them. You know, a hypocrite is a pretender, an actor, someone who's insincere. Typically, people don't self-identify as a hypocrite, right? People don't normally see themselves as a hypocrite. But Jesus says to not pray like the hypocrites, for they love to pray. Hypocrites love to pray. Um, a prayer life is more than loving to pray. 
Does that sound weird? Sounds like, man, loving praying, that seems like that would be the end of the series. If we can get to a place where I just truly love to pray, it's not even the beginning. Hypocrites love to pray. What is the motive? For them, it was this religious activity that they could do in the synagogues that could be done on the street corner. And it was a religious activity that they could do that would give them recognition. Oh, wow. This guy is very holy. I think I want to come and get advice from this person. But we can have different motives attached to why we pray. You can pray out of obligation. You can pray out of guilt. You can pray... Because you're in need, you can pray because it's an afterthought. You can pray because it's an emergency. But the first wrong motive that I want us to think about this morning is that when we, if we think of prayer as a religious activity, something that is separated from your life, it is a wrong motive. It doesn't take a street corner for prayer to become a religious activity. So... Um, A good prayer life is not measured by activity. It's not like fitness, okay? Fitness, I'm into fitness. You can kind of measure that. Well, how much activity are you doing with cardio? How much are you doing with weights? What does your eating plan look like? And it can be measured by activity. You can't simply measure uh, uh, the prayer life by the activity of prayer. Oh, that I pray for 30 minutes a day, that I pray for an hour a day. It's not a religious workout. It's not about putting in the time. Like I feel like I would be a bad preacher if at the conclusion of this series, what we were going to provide was we were going to dip in the budget. We don't, it's not there, but we're going to do it anyway. And we're going to give everyone a very nice hour sand glass. And this is the answer. This is the prayer life. That if you simply take this hourglass, it's got the Argyle logo right there on the bottom. It's real nice. And just flip that over and every day spend one hour in prayer. I think that's bad advice. Prayer is not simply just an activity that we are involved in that is separate from everything else we are involved in. I'm not saying that it's bad. There could be fruit in that for a lot of people if that became your your practice. If there's someone here today who has an hour sand timer, I'm, I'm not speaking to you, okay? It's not the answer. It's not just something that is apart from our life. Remember we read in 1 Thessalonians 5, do not go to sleep, stay awake, pray without ceasing, because even that is measured. Even that is praying, there's a start and there's a stop. If prayer is a quota of time you spend, is it religious or a relationship? So here's a way of of thinking about it. Someone could ask me, um, hey, Brad, um, I want to know how is your relationship with Michelle? And I could answer them, well, last week we spent three hours together. It's not that that's not an important detail in our relationship. But the time that I spend with Michelle is not an indication of the relationship. It doesn't answer the question. And just having a specific time in your life that is dedicated to prayer doesn't necessarily mean that you have the greatest relationship with the Creator. Prayer life cannot be a simple thing that is outside of of everything else you experience. Um... How many of you have been involved in a 24-hour prayer chain? You've signed up for an hour to pray for that hour. Um, I see several hands. I'll have, some, I'll have a confession this morning. I have been a part of some 24-hour prayer chains where I took an hour. And I feel like I did not do that great of a job. I lost focus. I've been like, how long am I praying here? It's been 10 minutes? I got 50 more minutes to pray about this specific thing, I'm telling you, I, I'm sure there's pe- there are people that get on their knees and they, before they know it, the hour is up and I can't believe I've been praying. Well, it's not just about setting aside a specific time. The wrong motive in prayer is that it is simply an aspect, a part of your life. Here's the second wrong motive. Praying for your will. Praying for your will. 
Prayer is not about moving God towards your idea of what you think is best for your life. It is a wrong motive. Let's look to Jesus. In, in John chapter 5, Jesus says this, So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing on His own accord, but only what He sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. Jesus says, first off, I can do nothing on my own accord, on my own will, of myself, but only what He sees the Father. I don't believe that Jesus had a different special kind of physical vision that he actually saw God the Father doing things and then he's just he copied it it was what he could envision the father doing later on in this chapter in verse 30 it says this I can do nothing on my own Jesus again reiterates this I can do nothing on my own as I hear I judge and my judgment is just because I seek not my own will but the will of him who sent me only what I see and hear from the Father. Jesus is saying it's the reason He makes just judgment is because I seek not my own will, but the will of Him who sent me. And that's really good in a prayer life because prayer can very easily become a will list. A will list of all the things in your life that you are sharing with God. God, please this. God, please not this. God, please this. God, please not this. And prayer can become just this, this time where we share all about our will to God. And I'm not saying that you don't share your desires with God. It's important to share your desires, to, to share what you, what you would will in life. But the way that I've begun to think about it is not just to share my will with God about trying to move Him into that will, but it's really sharing the why behind my will. And you're going to hear that and see that later today, but that's been very helpful for me, sharing the why behind your will. Because God still wants to hear from us. He wants to know us. He knows what we're going to say before we say it. But He wants to be in relationship with us. So, I've really questioned a lot of the things that I pray in my life. Um, there are, so as a father with three boys, I can on a regular basis pray for protection of my children from trials and temptations and hardships. There's a lot of them, right? And it could take up a whole lot of my time if I'm always praying for the protection of these things in my life. But you guys know like I know, sometimes trials are needed. Sometimes the things that we are the most afraid of are the things that actually change us and make us who God wants us to be. So who am I to stand before God and tell Him this is what needs to take place in my children's lives? If I can share with the why behind my will. So instead of sharing, hey God, I need you to protect, this tri protect my children from this child, I might say, God, I love my child so much and I am worried and concerned if they get hurt. I'm not trying to move God into a position, hey God, I'm sorry you're misinformed, but let me inform you about what's going on here. You need to protect. But I can share the why behind my will. I can share the heart behind the things that, I'm, that are on my heart. And praying for the will of God is good. Praying for the will of God is good because I do not claim to know what is best. It's a lesson that I've learned I'm grateful for. Like I said, who am I to know what's best? You may pray for your will when it comes to a job, a relationship, a hardship to be removed from, a decision you got to make that's left or right. I don't want my will. I don't want my will because guess what? Sometimes what I believe is the way isn't. What if that job will steal your heart? And God knows it. What if that relationship will steal away your worship? What if that hardship that you have a will about is the hardship that God needs to equip you for what He's preparing you for? Praying for the will of God is good. That left that I may want may be a dead end. Or it may be a U-turn that will hurt my heart along the way. Praying for the will of God is good. This is what we see Jesus do. Jesus in the garden, Luke 22, 42. Father, if you are willing, 
Remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. He reveals his heart. Man, if this could pass. If you are willing, I don't want to go to the cross. If you're willing, take this away. But don't let this be mistaken for me trying to move you to a different position because he says it, he claims it, and I think we need to do it in our own prayer life. Not my will, but yours be done. And praying for the will of God, not your own will, is actually a very freeing thing. Praying for the Father's will is freeing. Being surrendered to His will, guess what? I have much less to pray about. It's a weird thing that your your prayer life can become so much better by needing to pray so much less. Because that's all I want. There may have been a lot of left and rights, a lot of things I need to be delivered from, a lot of things that I would spend just sharing that my life's not right with God, but when I realize, no, I just really want your will, and I trust you, there's a lot less that I have to pray about. And it's freeing. I think the more that you trust the leader, the less you question his leading. And I think what you're left with in that prayer and that time and that communion with the indwelling of the Holy Spirit is just, I don't have this long list with you, but now I just want to worship I want to praise you. I just want to be with you in communion and fellowship. So here's a pattern. If you wanted to take a screenshot of this, this would be a good, um, uh, this next slide is, here's a pattern that we can practice this week. Instead of just sharing the will, your will, share the why behind your will. You know, um, if if you're married, you have probably experienced this, but have you ever been in a conversation with a spouse, and you know that there's something that's not being said. You can tell something's not being said, and sometimes something needs to be said. (laughs) Sometimes it's just about sharing of your heart that God wants to know from you. He does want to know the why behind your will. It's a sharing of your heart. But in that, like there's this yielding, but man, let's make this perfectly clear, not my will but your will be done in this. A yielding to His will. Do you desire His will more than your outcomes? If you don't, what are you doing? (laughs) We need to learn this lesson. He is a good Father. We can trust Him. So share the why of your will, leading to the yielding to His will in all things. And then what you're left with is you got some more time. Thank Him. Praise Him for His will for your belief in where He'll lead you today. You know, I thought again of a a conversation. You know, sometimes you have a long heart-to-heart with a spouse. And man, you spent and you got it out there. And you got this long heart-to-heart. Sometimes then you need to just relax. You need to go on a walk together. You need to hold hands. You need to hug. You need to be together. God wants to share, but wants us to share our heart with Him. Yield to His will and to be with Him. To be with Him in relationship. Trust and seek His will. So as a parent, if you can relate to this, um, you ever told your child you're going on some kind of trip, they've never done whatever you've got planned, and followed by that are just all kinds of questions because they want to know. They want to know you're leading them somewhere but they want to know if there's anything about where you're leading if it's counter to my will, right? Because I want to make sure I'm on board with this. You can absolutely trust in the leading of the Spirit in your life. The Father is a good Father. And I believe that anywhere you think you want to be in life is never better than just simply being with God in your life. You can trust Him. You can trust His will. He is the promised land. Thought of what kind of honeymoon would a honeymoon be if your spouse wasn't there? It's about being with Him. It's about being present with God. About trusting where He's going to lead you. So here we are about to enter a series about the prayer life. Our relationship with the indwelling Holy Spirit. Learning to pray without ceasing. I wonder if 
you think about your prayer life if you have allowed your prayer life to become a religious activity. Something that is simply just a part of your life in some kind of way, but it doesn't describe your life. I wonder if you're convicted this morning that sometimes the things that are on your heart that when you do come to God, it's really just a sharing of your will. And maybe you could be motivated to seek His will above all things. I'm going to have our our worship team come up. We're going to sing here in a moment. The prayer life is the full life. Quality life. I want to read from Psalm 16. This is uh, Psalm 16, verses 7 through 11. And then I'm going to offer a prayer. The service is yours. In uh, Psalm 16, verse 7, it says, I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me because He is at my right hand. I shall not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence, there is a fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Father, we just want to come to you as your children this morning and Lord I am so grateful to to know you in a new way in my life in the season where prayer is not something that's uh, designated to closets it's not designated when my eyes are closed but father it's a relationship that never ends from moment to moment father I pray the prayer life for For each one of us here today who desires to grow, to be with you, to abide with you in all that we do, Father, there's so much for me to learn. There's so much for our church to learn when it comes to being in relationship with the indwelling Holy Spirit that you have placed within us. But Father, I pray that this can be a blessing to us as we desire your will above our outcomes. Lord, bless us with the quality life of a prayer life. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing.